Good afternoon, dear friends. Um, today we are making the, or we are recording rather, the last session, the, our last lesson, the last session uh, in our course. Um, in our Chiang book, the subchapter is called 94 Second Derivative Test for Relative Extrema. So, the we have a function y equals f of x, which is a primitive function, and then um, we find its uh, stationary values by taking its first derivative uh, and equating it to zero, and afterwards we check the sign of the second derivative of this function. If a the second derivative of the function, which means the derivative of the derivative, at x0, at the stationary point, is negative, it's less than 0, then the function f is strictly concave. x0, fx0, this point is a local maximum, top of a hill. b, if the derivative, the second derivative of the function, f prime prime, f double prime, x0, is greater than 0 at this point, x0, at this stationary point, then the function is strictly convex in this neighborhood. Therefore, the point x0, fx0 is a local minimum, bottom of a volley. C, if the second derivative of the function at x0 is 0, the test is inconclusive. The point x0, fx0 can be a local maximum, minimum, or inflection point. One cannot know just judging by the sign of the second derivative. If it is negative, it's f is strictly concave, the point is local maximum. If f, uh, f double prime, the second derivative is positive at x0, then the function is strictly convex at this point, then x0, fx0 is a local minimum, a bottom of a volley. But if the second derivative at x0 is 0, the test is inconclusive. All right. So this stationary point can be a local maximum, minimum, a local minimum, or an inflection point. We may not know without further information. Just an example. y equals f of x equals x to the power 4. The first derivative of this function is 4x to the power 3. The second derivative is 12x squared, and at x0 equals 0, which makes 0 the first derivative, which is this only stationary point, you see, um, when f prime is 4x to the power 3, this quantity becomes 0 when x is 0, so the only stationary point of this function is x0 equals 0 and fx equals 0 as well, 0, 0, the origin, is the only stationary point of this function. But at this point, the second derivative of the function is 12x squared. When I replace 0 here, I obtain the second derivative as 0. So the test is inconclusive. But I know that 12x squared is positive everywhere, besides the point 0, 0. So, I know that this function is has a positive second derivative er everywhere. It is a strictly convex function, and the point zero zero is it's not an inflection point, but a local minimum, and uh, of course uh, uh, as well a, a global minimum. It is the bottom of a valley. You see. Another example: y equals f x equals four to the power x square minus x. 4x to the power 2 minus x, 4 times x squared minus x. This is our um, our primitive function. We take its first derivative, f prime x, which is 2 times 4, 8x minus 1, and equating it to 0, we find the unique uh, stationary point, where x star is 1 over 8. If we replace this a1 over 8 in the function, we op also obtain y star, its uh, function value of one, o 1 over 8, which is minus 1 over 16. 
So the point 1 over 8 mono, one, minus 1 over 16 is our only candidate for maximum, minimum, inflection point, whatever. We will check it. So the second derivative, the first derivative is 8x minus 1. The second derivative, which is the derivative of this one, of this the first derivative, is 8. And it is positive everywhere. Second derivative is 8, and it is positive everywhere. So the function is convex, everywhere convex. So the point, the stationary point we found, 1 over 8 minus 1 over 16, is a, a local and also global minimum, bottom of a valley. You see, so um, the second, the sign of the second derivative allow us to make a test and to judge in most cases whether the stationary point is a maximum or a minimum. All right. So another example, which is a little bit more intricate. The function y equals g of x equals x to the power 3 minus 3x to the power 2 plus 2. This is a third degree polynomial. When I take its first derivative, it is 3x squared minus 6x plus 0, which is 3x squared minus 6x. And equating it to 0, I find I will find the stationary point. 3x squared minus 6x is 3x times x minus 2. I can factorize it. And it's equal to 0. Great. So if a product is 0, one of the factors, at least, must be 0. So, or either 3x is 0, or x minus 2 is 0. If 3x is 0, x is 0, then x1 star, our first candidate, is 0. If x minus 2 is equal to 0, then x2 star minus 2 is equal to 0, so x2 star is 2. And replacing it in here, in the function itself, I can find uh, 0 minus 0 plus 2, 2. So 0, 2 is the first point. And replacing x2 star 2 in the function, I find um, g of 2, which is minus 2. So I have 0, the, I have 2 points, 2 candidates. 0, 2, and 2 minus 2. These are my candidates, my stationary points, my candidates for maximum, minimum, or inflection point, whatever. The, the second the sign of the second derivative at these points will show me what they are. That's why we call the first order condition necessary and the second order condition sufficient condition. Why sufficient? In order to show us the nature of this, uh, these points. You see? All right. So, the second, the first derivative of this function was 3x squared minus 6x. Taking once more the derivative, I obtain the second derivative, which is 6x minus 6 here. Great. Then, at the point 0, x1 star equals 0. When I replace 0 in the second derivative, it is 6 times 0, 0 minus 6 is minus 6. It is negative. So, if the second derivative is negative at this neighborhood, and in fact it is negative, yes, it is negative in this neighborhood, then g is strictly concave in this neighborhood. So that the point x1 star, y1 star, which is 0, 2, is a relative or local maximum, top of a hill. When I replace x2 star equals 2 in the second derivative, I obtain 6 times 2 minus 6, which is 12 minus 6, 6, which is positive. Therefore, g is strictly convex at this neighborhood in the vicinity of the point 2 neighborhood means this. All right, then x2 star, y2 star, which is 2 minus 2, the point 2 minus 2, is a relative or local minimum, bottom of a volley. You see? This is the result of all these concavity convexity, the, the curvature discussion we made before in the previous sections. All right, so necessary and sufficient conditions, indeed. The first order condition, FOC, first order condition, F prime x equals 0 is a necessary condition for a relative extremum. To find a relative extremum, but not sufficient. Not sufficient to say, to say what it is. Once this is fulfilled for a relative maximum, top of a hill, the second derivative of the function at this point should be negative. 
And this is a suffi sufficient condition, not necessary, because on top of a hill, one may have also second derivative equals zero, as we have seen. Uh, or for a relative minimum, bottom of a valley, if the second derivative is positive. This is a sufficient condition and not necessary, because at the bottom uh, of a valley, one may have also the second derivative equals zero by chance, by and because the function is like this. You see, so the first order condition is necessary to find the candidates for maximum, minimum inflection point, whatever we are looking for, um, rather maximum and minimum. We are looking for the extrema. So we are looking for maximum or minimum. We are maximizing or minimizing a function. Optimizing means this. Uh, inflection point is, a, is another interim point we find passing by. So... Uh, then the first order condition is a necessary condition to find the candidate points. And the second order condition, then, for instance, here the second derivative test, which is looking at the sign of the second derivative at the very point. So this is sufficient but not necessary to say what these points are, uh, whether we found the maximum or minimum or an inflection point by chance. All right. So, let's make an economic example. Profit maximization conditions. Q is the quantity produced or sold. The total revenue, TR or RQ, total cost, TC, CQ, those are functions whose forms are not given to us for the moment. The objective function, the total profit function, which is denoted by P, is the total revenue minus total cost. This is the definition of profit. Our choice or control variable is Q, the quantity produced or sold. We try to maximize our objective function, which is the profit function, which is TR minus TC, or RQ minus CQ. The first order condition, necessary condition, is the first derivative of the profit, P prime Q, is equal to zero. And what does it mean? It means R prime Q minus C prime Q equals zero, which is equal to R prime Q equals C prime Q. The first derivative of the total revenue should be equal to the first derivative of the total cost. And what is it, what is the first derivative of the total revenue? It's the margin, marginal revenue function. What is the first derivative of the total cost? It is the marginal cost. So this is our famous condition, marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which we know from economics course. You see, this is the reason why marginal revenue should be equal to marginal cost at optimum. So at Q, Q star is where the marginal revenue is equal to marginal cost is an equilibrium point. It, it is a stationary point. But is it a minimum or maximum? We will decide it by looking at the second derivative. So second order sufficient condition is the second derivative of the profit function at Q star should be negative so that the function, the profit function should be uh, strictly concave and then the point we found should be uh, um, uh, well, a local uh, maximum which is top of a hill. So the second derivative of this uh, profit function is the first derivative of the first derivative which is R double prime Q minus C double prime Q. Second derivative of the total revenue minus second derivative of the uh, total cost, which is the first derivative of the marginal revenue minus first derivative of the marginal cost. It should be equal to less than zero. It should be negative in order the profit function to be strictly concave and our point to be maximum. But what does it mean? Uh, R double prime is the margin revenue, the slope of the margin revenue, the derivative of the margin revenue function, function, which is geometrically the slope of the margin revenue. The second derivative of C, the total uh, cost, is the first derivative of the marginal cost, which is the slope of the marginal cost. That, uh, that means the slope of the margin revenue should be less than the slope of marginal cost in uh, algebraic terms not in absolute value, but in algebraic terms. 
if both are uh, safe. Well, marginal cost should be positive. Its slope can be negative. Uh, if margin, the slope of the margin cost is negative, the, the slope of the marginal revenue should be even more negative. Or marginal cost, slope of the margin cost may be positive and margin revenue, the debt of the margin revenue may be negative. In any case, if both are positive, then the slope of the marginal revenue should be less than anyway the slope of the marginal cost in order that the Q star be a local maximum top of a hill. We have a, a figure in the in the coming um, slide. We have a figure uh, which is taken from our book as well. Uh, we will see, but here there is a problem in my uh, slide. This is correct, but here the program hides the last uh, line from our site. Anyway, uh, let's see this. Let's go over this, these uh, graphs. This is the graph figure 97 from the book. And here uh, we have three graphs, in fact. One is the total curves, the total revenue and total cost curve. The uh, uppermost graph depicts the uh, quantity x, the x axis. On all these three graphs, we have quantity at the x axis. At the y axis, we have different things. On the uppermost graph, we have on the y axis, we have the total revenue and total cost. So this simple concave, strictly concave function, going like this, like a parabola, is the total revenue function. This S-shaped function is the total cost function. And it is a realistic picture of the of the cost function as well and of the revenue function. We expect the to total cost and to total revenue functions to behave like this. All right. There are some critical, some interesting points here. Two of these are Q2 and Q4. Q2 and Q4 are so-called break-even points, break-even points. What are the break-even points? Those are the points, the quantities produced or sold, where the total cost equals total revenue. The profit is zero, not the derivative. The total profit is zero. Total cost equals total revenue, so the total profit is zero. These two points, Q2 and Q4, are the break-even points, where the total cost is equal to total revenue. There is no profit and no loss. All right. Then we have Q1, where the total cost is um, the most sort of, it is uh, greater than the total revenue, and the distance between the two is the most here. How do I know it? Because the slope of the tangent lines are parallel. They are the same here. That they are parallel. The tangent lines are parallel here. Otherwise, they change. And I, we will see this. It, it corresponds to the, our uh, first order condition. That the first derivative the, of the total cost is equal to first derivative of the uh, total revenue. And we obtain another point here where the total revenue is about total cost. So the profit is positive. Here at the Q1, the profit is negative. We have a loss. At Q3, the profit is positive. The total revenue is over total cost. There is a positive profit. And again, the slope of the two curves are parallel. They are the same. The slopes are the same um, algebraically. And the tangent lines are parallel. In fact, we are not looking for Q1, but Q3, where the profit is maximum. Q1 is the point where the profit is minimum. It is negative. There is loss here. Here there is profit. We are looking for the maximum profit indeed. So in the second graph, the profit function resulting from these two functions are, uh, is depicted. You see, the profit is the distance between the total cost and total revenue. Total revenue minus total cost. 
Here the total revenue is under total cost. So total revenue minus total cost is negative from zero up to Q2. At Q2 it is zero. At Q4 it is zero as well. So the profit line, the profit curve, cuts the x-axis where it is the profit is zero at Q2 and Q4. Those are break-even points. Besides, here at when Q is zero, we have a negative profit. We have a zero revenue when the when you don't produce or sell something, you have zero revenue. But the total cost is positive because of the fixed cost, as we know from before. So the function, the profit function, come, uh, become, uh, sort of starts from a ne negative value. We make loss at the beginning of the production. Then this loss augments. You see the distance between the two, the total cost and total revenue augment. Where up to this point, where we have the minimum uh, profit, maximum loss. Loss is the negative of the profit. Here we have the most negative distance. This is the maximum loss, minimum profit point, Q1. Then the distance sort of um, it starts diminishing. Still, the total cost is all about total revenue. So there is still loss, but the loss is diminishing up to Q2, where there is no more loss. You see, the loss augments, the profit diminishes, then it augments, the loss diminishes, and it becomes zero at Q2. Then after Q2, we have total cost over about total revenue. The total revenue about total cost, I mean. So we have a positive profit here. We have positive profit. Where is it the most, the, uh, the um, well, sort of the highest point, profit point? It is these between H and G, the, where the uh, total revenue function is above and um, as far as possible from the total cost function. This distance is the maximum. So the total profit is maximum at Q3. We are looking for this point where the tangent line to the profit function is um, it is parallel to the Q axis. And here again, at the maximum loss or minimum profit point, we have the same particularity as well. And then afterwards, the profit diminishes, 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 becomes zero at Q4. It is the second break-even point, after which the total cost goes over, beyond and above the total revenue and then we have negative profit we have loss all over from here to eternity to the plus infinity we have the total um, profit going from zero to minus infinity and q goes to plus infinity the total profit goes to minus infinity as you see this is the graph of the total profit then we have the marginals in the third graph uh, the lowermost graph, we have the Q as an x-axis, and at the y-axis we have marginal revenue and marginal cost. The marginal revenue function is relatively simpler. It's a downward sloping, everywhere downward sloping function. Why? The uh, slope of the total revenue diminishes all, all, all uh, along the curve. You see, it starts from positive, it becomes less positive, less positive, less positive. At some point, at near Q4, it becomes zero. And then afterwards, it starts uh, be, um, the diminishing, meaning then the margin revenue becomes negative here. You see, uh, margin revenue is positive, but diminishing, diminishing, diminishing. And here, here at this point, it is zero. And afterwards, the margin revenue is negative. The total revenue is diminish, diminishes. See? Up to this point, the total revenue augments, but it augments uh, in a sort of in a diminishing speed, and then afterwards it diminishes absolutely as well. So this is the marginal revenue function. The marginal cost is more uh, sorry, well, it's a bit more complicated because the margin the total cost function might makes is the S shape. So here the slope augments, then diminish, and no, the, the, I mean the slope diminishes, the slope is positive but diminishes. 
diminishes, diminishes up to some point here, somewhere here, it diminishes. So it is more or less this point where the uh, marginal cost curve attains its minimum point here. So the total cost, uh, the total cost is positive, but its slope, marginal cost, diminishes up to this point, after which it starts augmenting again. So the marginal cost function makes a U shape, this U shape, you see? There's a minimum point somewhere here, here. Not necessarily at Q2, but probably after Q2 somewhere here. All right. So this is the behavior of the total revenue, total cost, total profit, and marginal revenue and marginal cost functions. At um, Q1, as you see, the marginal cost function is more negative, marginal revenue is less negative. So that the marginal cost function cuts marginal revenue from below is not fulfilled. But here at Q3, marginal revenue is still negative, but marginal cost is positive, and it, co it um, well, I mean, marginal revenue is diminishing and marginal cost is upward sloping. Therefore, the slope of the marginal revenue is negative, the slope of the marginal cost is positive. So the marginal cost cuts marginal revenue from below. This is uh, where the second derivative is most negative. The second derivative of the total profit function is most negative. The total profit function is concave, strictly concave, and the Q3 is the relative and also absolute maximum of this function from zero to, from, from Q from zero to infinity. You see? It has no absolute minimum. It goes to minus infinity, but it has a relative minimum, which is Q1. So this is the essence of this analysis, of the second derivative analysis. All right. Um, here, at the previous slide, we have the same analysis as we have seen. We have seen the two break-even points, where R is equal to C, total revenue is total, equal to total cost, and Q1 and Q3, the stationary critical points, where the first derivative of the total revenue is equal to the first derivative of the uh, total cost, which is marginal revenue, because marginal cost. But at Q1, the second derivative of the profit function is positive. So P is strictly convex, and Q1 is a local minimum, bottom of FOLA, not the local maximum. At Q3, here uh, it is hidden, but it says at Q3, the second derivative is negative, the, of the profit function is negative, so the profit function at this region is strictly concave, and the point Q3, and its profit equivalent, uh, the sort of the corresponding profit, is the local and also global maximum, which is top of a hill. This is what it says. All right, then, let's see. Uh, here we have some uh, numeric examples. The example one, it's exactly the uh, the example we have seen in numerical terms. The graph, the graphs we have studied are probably graphs of these functions, and these functions have some weird coefficients as you have seen, uh, as you see here. Uh, that's because it's a very realistic example, probably taken from some real problem, real firm or something. That's why the coefficients are so decimal, so sort of, it's not 60, but 61.24, something like this. These are from a uh, realistic example. All right, the uh, example one is profit maximization, great. What is the total revenue? It is in terms of quantity produced and sold, of course. RQ is 1200Q minus to Q square. This is our uh, total revenue function. It is um, strictly concave, as you see, because the, neg the coefficient of the square term is negative. So it's a downward-looking parabola, this function. CQ, the total cost function, is Q cube minus 61.25 Q square 
plus uh, 1528.5 Q plus 2000. 2000 is the fixed cost. The, others, the other part is the variable cost, depending on Q, as you know. All right. So the first thing to do is to form the profit function, which is total revenue minus total cost. When you subtract uh, CQ minus RQ, all this stuff minus Q3, when you multiply CQ by minus 1 and add to this, we obtain minus Q3 plus 61.25 Q square minus 1528.5 Q minus 2000 plus 1200 Q minus 2 Q square. All in all, when you sum them up, you obtain minus Q square, Q cube, I mean, Y minus Q cube plus 59.25 Q square minus 328.5 Q minus 2000. This is our profit, total profit function. What shall we do? We want to maximize it using quantity produced or sold, of course. So we will take the first derivative of this function with respect to Q. What is it? Minus 3 Q square plus 2 times 59.25, which is 118.5 Q, minus 328.5, and minus 2000 is a uh, constant, so its derivative is zero. So all in all, we obtain this second degree polynomial as our um, as the first derivative of our profit function, and it we should equate it to zero. When we equate it to zero and solve these uh, root, his roots, so the roots of this function, the, this equation, I mean, the second degree equation here, what shall we do? We can, it's not easy to see the roots, so we can use the delta, the discriminant method we have uh, learned uh, at the beginning. You know the delta, the discriminant, b squared minus 4a times c, the square root of this, what is it? Minus b plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac, the whole over uh, 2a. This is the delta, the discriminant method. Using the, the discriminant method, you find the roots of this uh, second degree equation, and you find two solutions, q1 star equals 3, and q2 star equals 36.5. Uh, so those are the two roots of this second degree equation. So this is the first order condition. Now we have two candidates, Q1 star equals 3 and Q2 star equals, uh, equals 36.5. But we don't know which one is which one. Which one is mi the minimum, which one is the maximum. Which one is the bottom of a valley, the other one, the top of a hill. We are looking for the maximum. All right, then we make the second derivative test as a second order condition, sufficient condition. We take the second derivative of the uh, profit, which is the first derivative of the first derivative, which is minus 6q plus 118.5 here. Then we will replace our candidates in this second derivative to see its sign, the sign of this one, of the second derivative, in the neighborhood of these uh, candidates these candidate points. So 3 times 6 is 18. There is minus also, minus 18 plus 118.5 is 100.5. The second derivative of the profit function at the point 3 is 100.5, which is positive, which means the function is strictly convex. And you should make all these, all these anal analyses. So you should make all these, you should follow all this logic throughout. All right, then, if the profit function is strictly convex at this region, it means the Q1 star is a local minimum, bottom of a valley. So this is not the maximum we are looking, it's uh, the opposite, it's the minimum, it's the uh, uppermost loss point. It is the lowermost profit point, it is the uppermost loss point as in the graph, in the previous graph. If you see, here we have the minimum profit, maximum loss. And then at Q3, we find the maximum profit. 
here the profit function is strictly convex here the other in the other region strictly, uh, it is strictly concave we are looking for this q3 all right so q1 star equals 3 is not our point so let's check q2 star 36.5 great replace it in the second derivative function minus 6 times 36.5 it makes uh, 100, um, what does it mean? Uh, minus 136 something, uh, to 200, I mean 236. When you, uh, or 218.5 uh, or 218, whatever, you have just put it here and calculate it. Minus 6 times 36.5. And then when you add plus 118.5, you obtain this time minus 100.5 at q2 star which is 36.5 the second derivative at this point is minus 100.5 very symmetric and it is negative of course if the second derivative is negative it means the function is strictly concave at this region then the point we have found q2 star 36.5 is a local maximum top of a hill you see so the second derivative test is conclusive in this case. Another interesting example for using the uh, optimization. Cubic total cost function. Now we will see why the total cost function has to be uh, to have some weird coefficients. Because it should obey some rules, some particularities to be interpreted as a cost function is a total cost function so we will see all right cq which is a total cost function is equal to a times q3 plus b times q square plus cq plus d this is a cubic third degree cost function well what the coefficients a b c d or what particularities they should have in order this function to be interpreted as a total cost function. So we will discuss this in this example. Great. Which properties must have the coefficients a, b, c, d for this function to be interpreted as a total cost function? Very good. Well, what are the properties then? When uh, the, where, where the properties? One, there is no work without fixed cost. You can do nothing without a fixed cost. Even in the most service-oriented sectors, or whatever you produce, whatever you sell, you always have a fixed cost, be it great or small. Big or small, but you will always have a fixed cost. Even if you don't produce one unit of Q, you should incur some fixed cost beforehand. You can think of any sector, any weird job. There is no job, there is no sector, there is no production without a fixed cost. Not in our planet. Not on our planet, not in our universe. So, uh, first there should be a fixed cost. So, D should be positive. Here is the first property. D, coefficient D, should be positive. This is the fixed cost. Where Q is zero. There is no production, Q is zero, then the total cost of zero is D. The total cost of the, the, of the zero production is not zero, it is a positive cost. Because if you produce, I don't know, even if you sell some uh, cement somewhere, some uh, bread, uh, some bagels, whatever, at the corner of the street, you should have a kind of... Um, I don't know, a tray or something, for instance, a tray to put your cements, your bagels on it, your pretzels, if you wish, on it. Then perhaps you should pay a um, fee to the municipality in order to get the permission to sell these things over there, the, your, your bagels, your pretzels over there, your cement over there. Then you see, 
even before selling one simit, one pretzel, you have to incur some fixed cost. How small, however small it can be. So the TD should be positive. Two, if the quantity produced augments, augments, if the quantity produced augments, the total cost also must augment. Well, what do we know from the physics? The first law of the physics of our universe is the uh, Lavoisier law, which is n nothing can be produced out of, or no nothing appears out of nothing, and nothing disappears. Nothing is produced, is created from nil, and nothing disappears um, totally. Energy is transferred to matter, and matter is transferred to energy. And the second law of the universe is that the entropy, which is the negative of the energy, which is the um, disorganization, it augments. It always augments. It doesn't diminish. It may diminish locally, but in the, in the scale of the universe, it always augments, augments. So what does it mean? It means that whenever we produce something, we have to use some material, some energy, some material. Under any form it can be, but we should use some extra energy, some extra material, some extra inputs. We can't produce something without inputs. And we this always incurs a cost to the universe and to ourselves, to our society as well. So there is no extra production without augmenting the total cost. So the marginal cost, which is the cost of the last unit, should also be positive. You see how the physics is, uh, is sort of related or how the economics is related to physics. We can't do economics without thinking to physics. So, um, that means one must have A positive. Why? If A is negative, if this coefficient A is negative, then the it is the coefficient of the third, third degree term, then when Q augments, at the end, uh, the CQ should go at the end to the minus infinity, but this is not possible. CQ must always augment, to, uh, must always augment towards um, infinity, plus infinity. So A should be positive. But we will also obtain it with mathematics, with arithmetics. So, uh, and marginal cost must always be greater than zero. Marginal cost cannot be zero or negative. You cannot produce an extra unit of something, even of, of a, a service, let alone material production. But even a service cannot be produced, the last unit of a service cannot be produced without extra cost. So my marginal cost should always be positive. That means the minimum of the marginal cost function must be also positive. If my, my, my marginal cost function should be positive everywhere, then its minimum point should be positive as well. Therefore, we will calculate the minimum point of the marginal cost and then make it greater than zero, where also the quantity produced Q star uh, would be positive, because the quantity, as we understand, cannot be negative. All right. So, here is the optimization. Here is the derivative, here is the optimization. We should optimize, we should find the minimum value of the marginal cost function and make equate it to make it positive. All right. What is the marginal cost function? It's C prime Q, the first derivative of the total cost function, which is 3AQ square plus 2BQ plus C plus D is, uh, well, it's constant, it's derivative is zero. So we obtain marginal cost equals 3aq squared plus 2bq plus c. And this should be greater than zero. So this is a parabola. 3aq squared plus 2bq plus c is a parabola. And it should be 
a parabola with arms upward looking. If it is inverse U shape, downward looking parabola, then its arms will go towards minus infinity, which we um, which we don't uh, we don't want because marginal cost cannot be negative. So it should uh, the um, the arms of the marginal cost of this parabola should look upwards. Then this coefficient of the square term should be positive, as we know. But this is not sufficient. At the bottom point of this marginal cost as well, the marginal cost of Q star should be greater than zero. Not only that the arms of the parabola should be looking upwards, but its bottom point should be also at a positive quantity and its value, its height of the marginal cost should be positive as well. So that we don't we don't sort of fall in a region where the marginal cost is negative. We should not allow marginal cost to be negative anywhere. So its minimum point should be also positive. How shall we do it? We will uh, we will um, find the minimum of the marginal cost. So the marginal cost function is this one. We will also minimize this one, taking its first derivative finding its critical point and then taking the second derivative and making it uh, positive. It should be convex. Let's see. So the marginal cost function is C prime Q, this one. 3AQ squared plus 2BQ plus C. What is the, the derivative of the marginal cost function? It is the derivative of this one. So 2 times 3AQ plus 2b. This is the derivative of the marginal cost, which is the second derivative of the total cost. 6aq plus 2b. And this should be equal to 0 as well, because we are minimizing the marginal cost. First order condition for the minimum of marginal cost is this. From here, we solve the q star as 2b, we put it to the other side, minus 2b over 6a, you see. And simplifying, we obtain minus b over 3a. This is the q star. This is our only candidate for minimum marginal cost. The point, the quantity, where we should obtain the minimum marginal cost. So, this q star should be positive. We cannot have a negative quantity. So, this q star should be positive. And a must be positive as well. Because the parabola should look upwards. So, if a is positive... 3 is positive, their product is positive. B, a minus, there is a minus here. If 3A is positive, in order Q star to be positive, minus B should be positive as well. The, the numerator should be positive. If the denominator is positive, the numerator as well should be positive to be obtain positive over positive, a positive Q star. But then B must be negative. Why? There is a negative sign here in front, so minus b should be positive, then b must be negative. We found another property, b, b, this coefficient must be negative in a cubic total cost function. a should be positive, b should be negative, d should be positive. What about c? All right. Then, what is the minimum of the marginal, the minimum height, the minimum point of the marginal cost, the minimum value of the marginal cost function? The Q star, the minimum, quant the minimum, how can I say, the quantity minimizing the marginal cost function is minus B over 3A. Great. But then we should replace it in the marginal cost function here and ob say, obtain its marginal cost value and make it uh, greater than zero as well, make it positive as well. So 3A, where is it? It's here, 3A times minus B over 3A squared plus 2b times minus, 3, minus b over 3a plus c. This is the minimum value of the marginal cost. Simplifying, effectuating the calculations and simplifying, we obtain b squared minus 2b squared plus 3ac over 3a. Just make the calculations. And this is equal to 3ac minus b squared over 3a. And this should be equal to 0. This is the minimum value of the marginal cost. And A is zero, is greater than zero, A is positive, as we said. 
So 3a is positive, which means the denominator is positive. Denominator is positive. The numerator should be positive as well, so that the positive over positive should be positive. Which means 3ac minus b square should be positive. But then we can obtain c from here. Put minus b square to the other side. It becomes b square. And divide by 3. So c must be greater than b square over 3a. Which is also b square is positive. 3a is positive. Positive or positive is positive. So c should be positive. But not only. It should be also greater than b square over 3a. So we have also found another property, which is the sign and the and the how can I say the, the value of c. The c should be greater than b square over 3a, which is greater than zero as well. So in conclusion, in a cubic total cost function, a c d should be positive, b should be negative, and c should be greater than b square over 3a. You see why in this previous example here, we have these weird sort of coefficients. But here you see B is minus, minus 61 or 25 as expected. Q3 is one, the coefficient of Q3 is one positive and the other coefficients are positive as well. So here in this uh, numeric example, we have a to total cost, fun cost function, a cubic total cost function which abides the rules, the properties we have found now. You see? All right. Another example. Uh, the upward sloping marginal revenue curve. Can the a marginal revenue curve upward sloping? Let's see. The average revenue, which is the inverse demand function, is a function of Q. This is the inverse demand function we are accustomed to average revenue is the price price as a function of quantity as we draw in our economics books this is the way we draw in economics books the q is at, at the x-axis at the horizontal axis and p the price is at the vertical axis we in fact price is the average revenue we draw as a demand function we say demand function but it is, a, in fact, an inverse demand function because he, we depict this uh, as if price is a function of quantity. So this is an inverse demand function. If AR, which is P equals F times Q, F of Q, a function of a quantity, a quantity produced or sold, then total revenue is P times Q which is AR times Q. Average revenue is total revenue by Q, by uh, uh, divided by Q, divided by the quantity produced, which is the revenue by unit of quantity produced and sold. So the total revenue is the average revenue times quantity, you see, or price times quantity, if you wish. And the average revenue is a function of Q, F of Q times Q gives us the total revenue. But what is the marginal revenue? It is the first derivative of the total revenue with respect to Q, with respect to the quantity. So here we have a product, F of Q times Q. Then we have to take the derivative of this product. We know the, the formula of the der derivative of a product. What is it? The derivative of the first function times the second, the primitive of the second function plus the primitive of the second function multiplied by the derivative of this, uh, the primitive of the first function uh, multiplied by the derivative of the second function. U prime V plus U V prime, if you wish. So, the derivative of the first function is F prime Q times Q itself plus F of Q itself times the derivative of q with respect to q, which is 1. All right. So the marginal revenue function is f prime q times q plus f of q. Right. Is it this one we want? No. The slope of the marginal revenue. So the, we have to differentiate once more this marginal revenue function. Find its derivative which is the slope of the marginal revenue. All right, then we uh, take 
the derivative again. Slope of marginal revenue is equal to marginal revenue, the, the derivative of the marginal revenue with respect to hmm, quantity produced or sold. So here again, we take the derivative of this product and this one. F prime Q, when we differentiate again, F second, F double prime Q times Q plus F prime Q times the derivative of Q by Q is 1 and plus the derivative of this one, which is F prime Q. So here we have F prime Q times 1, which is F prime Q. Here again, and then another F prime Q. This is 2 times F prime Q, the first derivative of the average re revenue, which is the first derivative of the demand function, slope of the demand function, 2 times F prime Q, plus F double prime Q times Q. All right, so this is the slope we want. AR equals F of Q, our demand function, our average revenue function, our inverse demand function, in fact, our average revenue function, would be imperfectly competitive. If it is perfectly competitive, average revenue would be a constant function. Average revenue would not be a function of Q, it would be constant. And if it's constant, its slope is um, is zero, so we can't make this analysis. So probably if it's not a, a given good or a prestige good, which are rather rare cases, we would have an imperfect competitive demand function, which is a downward sloping inverse demand function. F prime Q would be negative in most cases, in the in the usual, in the general case, F prime Q, the inverse demand function will be downward sloping, as we depict in our economics books as well. And Q should be zero, greater than zero, but depending on the curvature of the function, on the concavity convexity of the function, AR equals FQ of our inverse demand function, the second derivative of Q can be positive or negative. It can even be zero. If the average revenue function, the inverse demand function, is concave, this, its second derivative will be negative. It's, if it is convex, it will be positive. If it is linear, its second derivative will be zero. So all is possible. So if the AR function equals F, F of Q function is strictly convex, its second derivative is positive. And if, here, what have we obtained for the slope of the marginal revenue? It is 2 times F prime Q plus the second derivative of Q times Q. Q is always positive, but second derivative of Q can be positive, negative, or zero, as we have seen. And assuming that uh, the inverse demand function is negatively sloping and a uh, sort of imperfect competitive demand function, F prime Q would be negative. 2 F prime Q would be negative as well. If the um, AR function is concave, strictly concave, or concave, uh, its second derivative will be negative as well. So uh, this negative times Q, which is positive, will be negative. The whole thing will be negative. The slope of the marginal revenue curve will be negative. But if the second derivative of uh, f with respect to q is zero, then it will be negative. The marginal slope of the marginal revenue will be negative as well. This part is negative. If it is greater than zero, if the second derivative of q is greater than zero, which is ar is strictly convex, we can have several cases as well. If the if second derivative is positive, but the absolute value of this term, F double prime Q times Q, the absolute value of this one is less than the absolute uh, value of 2 F prime Q. Uh, it means that the negative part is in absolute, absolute value greater than the positive part. So the whole thing, the sum will be negative as well. But if the absolute value of this part, the second part, F double prime Q times Q, if F double prime Q is positive, Q 
Q is positive, their product will be positive. And if the absolute value of this part is greater than the absolute value of 2 f prime Q, which is negative anyway, then we can have the sum as positive, you see. Then the marginal, the slope of the marginal, the, the derivative of the marginal value, which shows the slope of the marginal value at this, this region, would be greater than zero. The marginal value can be upward sloping, you see. And a uh, numeric example for this, the average for every function f of q is 8,000 minus 23q plus 1.1q square minus 0.018q q cube. This is an um, inverse demand function. The total revenue is this average revenue multiplied by q, which is 8,000q minus 23q square plus 1.1q uh, cube minus 0 0.018 q to the power 4. This is the total revenue function. Let's take its marginal revenue, which is the derivative of this one, the first derivative, 8,000 minus 14, 4, uh, 46 q plus 3.3 .3 q square minus 0.072 q cube. This is the first derivative. And the slope of this one, slope of this marginal revenue is in order to obtain it, we should differentiate it once more. We should take the derivative once more, which is 8,000 is constant, its derivative is 0, minus 46 plus 6.6q minus 0.216q uh, square. This is the second derivative of the total revenue and the first derivative of the marginal revenue, which is the slope of the marginal revenue. This this is a um, parabola. Can it be zero? Yes, it can be zero. Where can it be zero? Where um, the um, this equation, second degree equation, has its roots. You can find them with the delta discriminant method, minus b plus or minus square root of b square minus 4ac over 2a, you know, and obtain, just make it as an exercise, and you will find two roots, q1 star, 10.76 and q2 star 19.79 so this is a this is a parabola and this parabola is looking downwards its coefficient of this, the highest term of the square term is minus so this this is an inverse u shape the parabola is the downward looking so in general it is negative but does it have a positive region Yes, it has a positive region. Between these roots, it has a positive region. You can also calculate its, um, well, its uh, uppermost point, and you will find that it is positive. So the slope of the marginal revenue is positive between these two points, 10, the Q, which is, I mean, Q between 10.76 and 19.79 in this region. The margin revenue has a um, positive derivative. It is upward sloping. All right. And our last example. Then we have the exercises, which you will try. And you have also the solutions. And so this last example is very interesting because it is an example of the game theory. It's a very simple example of the game theory. You are making your introduction to the game theory now. It's a very interesting branch. It's a very interesting field in mathematics and economics as well. The example is maximization of the sales tax. So uh, an imperfect competitive firm plays against the tax authority, the maliye, the uh, the tax authority, the fiscal authority of the of the country. What does the fiscal authority? It gets taxes. And what does the firm? It well, it sells. It produces something and sell sells in order to maximize its profit. The aim of the firm is to maximize its profit. P taking into account the sales tax. In a game situation, there are players, 
these players can be human or one player can be the nature the other one a society an individual against individual individual against society or individual or society against nature all these games are possible here an individual firm not an individual person but an individual firm is playing against the tax authority of the of the country they will both maximize their objective functions taking into account the move of the other or the decision the moves of the other uh, player this is a strategic game strategy is exactly this actually you should take into account like in a chess game you should take into account you should ref reflect you should think and you should take into account the play the game the move of the other player and try to make your best move taking account uh, the other's move so this is uh, a strategic game the father of these games is the Nash John Nash uh, perhaps you have uh, seen the movie a beautiful mind in Turkish akıl oyunları beautiful mind uh, here this this movie that movie akıl oyunları the beautiful mind um, was uh, telling the life of this uh, famous Nobel Prize winner mathemat mathematician and economist John Nash he died some years ago he came to Turkey as well uh, and he gave some lectures here some conferences here and he died unfortunately in an uh, in a road accident not in Turkey I guess anyway all right may he rest in peace he was a great mathematician and economist uh, so uh, the aim of the firm is to maximize its profit P taking into account the sales tax the choice or policy variable is quantity the quantity produced and sold the aim of the tax authority is the, to maximize the sales tax revenue T uh, big case T equals small case T times Q taking into account the profit maximization uh, maximization of the firm the choice or policy variable of the tax authority the fiscal authority is the tax rate I say it's rate but here it is not a rate it is a value T why is it so because what we uh, what well, what is called in English the tax uh, the sales tax especially in the American usage the sales tax is what corresponds to our um, uh, ÖTV özel tüketim vergisi so this is uh, this is not value added tax don't confound it with value added tax it's another thing value added tax is a rate it's a ratio the sales tax is a fixed T a fixed sort of value in Turkish liras or dollars whatever taken from the from each unit of the quantity produced and sold for instance in these gasoline stations when you well, well when, you, when you buy gasoline for your uh, car almost the half of the price of the gasoline is this tax the sales tax ÖTV özel tüketim vergisi private uh, consumption tax we call it private consumption tax. it's the sales tax so for each liter of the uh, gasoline you pay let's say 20 liras this is T is 20 20 Turkish liras here this is a tax taken from each liter of gasoline each each unit of the quantity produced and sold so the firm you can just as an example take a gasoline station it will sell gasoline the quantity of gasoline maximize its profit taking into account this sales tax and the tax authority will maximize this big case T which is T small case T times Q the 
sales tax, its total sales tax revenue, it will maximize it T, uh, using T this time. The um, choice variable or the policy variable of the tax authority is the small T. Small case T. All right. Then taking a account, in taking into account the profit maximization of the uh, of the firm. So you see the gain. The choice variable or the policy variable of the tax authority is the small case T, which is per unit tax. Great. So the revenue function of the firm is minus alpha times Q square plus beta times Q. This is the revenue function. Its cost function is A times Q square plus BQ plus C. It's a quadratic cost function. Alpha, beta, A, B, C are all positive. If there is negative, then the negative is put in front of the coefficient. But these are the revenue and cost functions before tax. So we should ask ourselves, what is tax for the company, for the firm? It is a cost. For the company, the tax it pays, it pays is a cost. So it should be added to the cost function. What is the cost it would pay? What is the tax it would pay to the tax authority? It is T times Q. Whatever Q it sells, it will be multiplied by T, the unit tax, and the, the firm will pay T times Q to the tax authority. So in the cost function, we should add this T times Q to the cost. So C plus T times Q will be its new cost function, C star. C star is the new total cost function taking into account the sales tax, which is the move of the, of the tax authority. So C plus TQ, which is AQ square plus BQ plus C plus TQ. So here there is P, B, B, um, BQ, and here it is plus TQ. So we can just uh, add them together and say, uh, the new C star, the new total cost function of the firm, taking uh, into account the tax, will be AQ square plus B plus TQ plus C. This is the new cost function of the firm, taking into account the tax. It will pay to the tax authority, the move of the tax authority. So it will maximize profit function using this new cost function. So R minus C star will be its profit. By the way, this example doesn't appear in the fourth, uh, as far as I know, it doesn't appear in the fourth um, publishing of our book. It was in the third publishing, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, uh, but this is a good example, so I give it to you, so you should learn it as well. You are responsible of it. Very good example of game theory. Uh, and uh, you can also, uh, I mean, if you wish, if you like it, then you can read more, uh, you can take more game theory courses or you can read on game theory. In there, are, there's a lot of things in internet and uh, very good books on game theory. All right, so uh, what shall we do? Or what shall the firm do? It will maximize its profit taking into account the, the, the tax cost as well, which is R minus C star. What is R minus C star? Minus alpha Q square minus A Q square, which is minus alpha plus, uh, plus A Q square, plus beta Q minus beta plus T Q, which is beta minus B minus T times Q, and minus C. So if you when you subtract C star from R, and simplify, you will obtain this profit function. The firm will maximize this profit. How shall we do it? Very simple. Just take the first derivative and uh, make it equal to zero. So just make this two to put this two in front minus two times alpha plus a times q. Two minus one is one. And plus beta minus b, b minus t. 
minus c is constant, so its derivative is zero. So all in all, we obtain minus two times alpha plus a times q plus beta minus b minus t equals zero. What is q star? Just solve the q star from here, very easy. It is, well, you can put this beta minus b, beta uh, b minus t to the other side. It is minus times beta minus b minus t and divided by minus two times alpha plus a, minuses disappear, they annihilate each other. You are left with beta minus b minus t over two times alpha plus a. Well, all these coefficients are positive. So alpha plus a, alpha and a are positive. Their sum is positive. Two times alpha plus a is positive. Here we have q star beta minus b minus t. So t, first of all, should not be greater than beta minus b. Otherwise, q star will be negative. Then uh, the gasoline station will not sell gasoline. So one, it's not given in the, uh, it's not said in the problem, but we just observe it from here. Then, what makes the tax authority? It maximizes its, its tax revenue, which is T times Q star. Why? It can calculate. Both parts know each other's uh, sort of functions, each other's moves, everything, everybody knows everything. And the tax authority knows mathematics as well. They know how to calculate Q star. So they know that the firm will take into account the tax and arrange its uh, quantity sold accordingly. So it will produce Q star instead of Q. Beta minus B over T over uh, 2 times alpha plus A. The tax authority as well will calculate this and will multiply this Q star with T to obtain its objective function, big case T, and maximize it. So if we multiply small case T with all this Q star, what do we obtain? T times beta minus beta minus T uh, over 2 times alpha plus A, which is beta minus B times T minus T square over 2 times alpha plus A then the tax authority will maximize this. This is the objective function of the tax authority. What shall it do? It will take the derivative of this function with respect to t, which is its uh, policy variable, its choice variable. Very easy. 1 over 2 times alpha plus a is a constant coefficient. There is no t at the denominator, so we don't have to use the the, the quotient formula for the derivative. We will just take this simple derivative with respect to t. So it is beta minus b over 2 times alpha plus a minus 2 times t over 2 times alpha plus a, which is beta minus b over uh, minus 2t over 2 times alpha plus a. And we should equate it to 0. So the, uh, this is the derivative uh, of the big case t function of the sales tax revenue function with respect to small t. Then equate to zero. The denominator is not zero, so the numerator should be zero. Beta minus b minus 2t is equal to zero. So 2t is my beta minus b. t star is beta minus b over 2. So the tax authority should um, make its small t the unit tax value, beta minus b over 2. Then, if the tax uh, authority makes this, both the firm and the tax authority have done their best move. They can't be better off. This is their, their best move. So, um, this means there is no reason to change their moves again. The gasoline station, the firm, will produce and sell Q star, beta minus B minus T over 2 alpha plus A. And the tax authority will get its tax, its optimum tax, which is beta minus B or the tax rate or tax uh, unit tax, let's call it, it's small t, equal to beta minus B over 2t. Of course, 
multiplying it with Q star, you can also obtain the, the, the total T star, the big T star as well, if you wish. But this is important. So as a result, both players would make their best moves. This is a Nash equilibrium where no player has a better move. All players have the, their best moves. It's an equilibrium. They don't change their moves. This is Nash equilibrium. And as a homework, check the second order condition. See whether these quantities are uh, really the maximum profit and maximum tax revenue. But this is very easy. You will take the second derivative of each function, each profit and tax function, and see that they are negative. A very easy thing. So make it as a homework, second order condition, to, to check, to test that they are really maximum and not minimum. That the functions are concave, the second derivatives are negative, that the functions are concave, and you have found the maximum values of these two sort of uh, functions. So this is your homework as well. And our lecture and our lesson um, is, well, uh, it finishes here. You have exercises as well. You will uh, just, you just solve them, try to solve them by yourself, and then look at the solutions at the solution book. And if you don't understand something, or in the, you can, whatever you wish, you can always contact me by via my phone, my cell phone, my email, or whatever. WhatsApp, whatever. And our exam will be a online test, multiple choice test, a random, the chosen questions from some categories, which we have covered, of course. I have never asked something which I haven't covered in during the classes. Uh, all the material is the material we have covered during our lectures, these three, 13 lectures we have recorded up to now. And the book, of course, the corresponding chapters in the book, the corresponding exercises, what we have covered. And we will have, I don't know how many questions, but I will see about 20, 30 questions, something like this. And I will, you will have three trials. And from these trials, uh, the exam will open um, probably just before the, before the fest holiday, festivity holiday, uh, the Friday. Uh, I will try to open it on in the morning or perhaps uh, even uh, Thursday afternoon, Thursday night, perhaps. And then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, it will be open. The Sunday night at the midnight, it will close. We will have um, two and a half, three days uh, for making three trials. And the best mark you will get from these three trials will be your, hopefully, passing mark, the final mark of the lesson of the course. Uh, all is automatic. The system will make the exam, not me. I will prepare the exam. And afterwards, the system will make you the exam. It will choose the questions randomly from several categories. And it will also change the order of the questions randomly, the order of the answers randomly, so that even I myself cannot take the same exam twice. The exam will be different at each time, but the questions will be from the same categories from the what we have covered. And you, it will be a very nice sort of uh, multiple choice test. We uh, applied it as well during the pandemic pandemia period, and it was pandemic period. It was. Uh, it was not bad at all. It was a quite a success. Uh, you, of course, you can use your book. The book is open, no problem. But you cannot use another person or an artificial intelligence uh, to help you. This is forbidden. You can use your book. Your, I advise you to make a, a, a formulary, a list of formula of the book of the chapters we have covered, of the material we have covered, because when the time frame is so limited in a test, 
then uh, you cannot read the book. You can check the the formula reader uh, and then uh, answer the questions. You will have more or less two two and a half minutes per question, and it will be um, you will not be able to go back in time in in, in questions, but it will go forward all the time. But you can allocate your time um, as you wish. You will not go back to the to the previous question. When you answer a question, you will pass to the second one, to the other one. Um, you will not go back. But uh, if a question requires, let's say, 30 seconds, you can use the remaining seconds for the common questions. So all in all, you will have enough time for more or less two, two and a half minutes per question, and it will be sufficient. There won't be big problems. There will be rather small questions, multiple choice questions. Some will be a little bit bigger than the others, but you will have enough time to cover all the questions. So this is the format of the exam. And uh, you will have three trials. You will get the best mark of these three trials as the uh, as the mark of the course. So thank you for today. I will stop the recording and uh, I wish you much success in your exams.